Coming up today, a busy week in the market kicks off. Will the US become the crypto capital of the planet and start a strategic national reserve in Bitcoin? Stocks could be approaching a watershed moment. A preview of the Fed this week. US national debt hits 35 trillion for the first time. An update on commodities and what to expect this week. It's going to be a big one, guys. Let's go. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to the channel. I trust you've all had a relaxing weekend. Feeling sharp and ready for this big week in financial markets. We got central bank meetings, kicking off with the Bank of Japan tomorrow. Then we got Bank of England, got the Federal Reserve of the United States. It's also the largest week in Q2 earnings season. A lot of mega cap tech reporting. And on top of that, we're heading into the first Friday of the month. And you guys know what that means. Jobs report. We should see quite a lot of repricing across global financial markets this week. Starting off a bit quiet as usual, low range on S&P 500, 5463. Doing a bit of coiling and retracing from that big down day we saw last Wednesday. Still got mixed breadth though. Isn't bearish breadth across the board. It's mostly tech and semis pulling the S&P and NASDAQ lower. In fact, we've still got energy, industrials, financials, healthcare, staples and utilities all above their key moving averages. Then we've got bond yields, oil, the dollar and inflation expectations downtrending across the board, which should give a little bit of support to equities right here. However, the language we get from Jay Powell this Wednesday could have a big impact, could give us a hint at whether he's going to cut rates. When they meet up again in September, we'll also be looking for big earnings report from Mike Microsoft tomorrow, along with Apple on Thursday. We'll also get to hear from Amazon and Meta this week as well. For the here and now, S&P 500 still just trading underneath its 50-day VWAP. Even more so, the Magnificent 7 dragging the whole Nasdaq down with it. Whilst we've still got the Dow Jones Industrial Average, blue chip stocks, mid caps, and even though the Russell 2000 had the biggest pullback today, over 1%, it's still technically overbought here in the short term and still trading a lot stronger than the S&P 500 and NASDAQ. Still got this big rotation holding up, along with market breadth overall. 69% of stocks above their 50-day moving average. And once again, the amount of stocks hitting 52-week highs, easily outpacing 52-week lows. Still a little backwardation up the front and the volatility term structure with the VIX 9-day, 17.3. Bit over the VIX 30-day at 16.5. Option deal is probably pricing in. The risk of movement this week with all the economic data and earnings that we're going to be seeing over the coming days. And so it'll be interesting to see how we finish the week and the VIX. Are we going to get a big VIX crush with dovish talk from Jay Powell? Really good Q2 earnings season and a jobs report coming in line with expectations. Still giving the Fed permission to cut rates without spooking investors of an imminent recession? Or is Jay Powell going to push back on the possibility of rate cuts? this September and talk about how he's worried about potential impacts of new tariffs we'll have on inflation going into next year with, with a potential change of US government. Are we going to hear some negative guidance on AI CapEx from some of the mega cap tech? And is the unemployment rate actually going to go down, removing the possibility of a Fed rate cut? Or is it going to go up so much it gets investors spooked of a recession? And then we see the VIX take out the 20 handle for the first time since April. Could be an interesting week. Make sure you stay tuned into this channel and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, and I'll keep you updated every day on what's happening out there so you don't fall behind the curve. There's a look at the government bond two-year yield to start the week off 440. Still a big gap between the Fed funds rate at 525. I'll be touching on TLT a little bit later on this video. I'll show you a seasonality pattern, what we could see from that in the coming weeks and months. For the here and now, we've still got high yield bonds holding up firm, trading well. Dollar perked up a little bit there today. But we're going to start off today with one of the biggest stories hitting the wires across financial markets these last 24, 48 hours. And that is of Bitcoin. After we just heard Trump speak at the Bitcoin conference in Nashville, Tennessee, to briefly get above $70,000 a coin earlier today before turning back finishing at 67. Still really close to all-time highs, a bit below 74,000 a coin that we saw in mid-March. So just to sum up for you what Trump said at the Bitcoin conference, he wants to make the US a Bitcoin superpower and crypto capital of the planet if he's elected. He announced that he raised $25 million in cryptocurrency donations just over the past two months. And he's got a lot of support from notable crypto investors, including the Winklevoss twins, who are both donating Bitcoin to him as well. He also said he plans to replace the SEC chair, Gary Gensler, who was a vocal critic and opposed to cryptocurrency. And he wants to create a strategic national Bitcoin stockpile from all the confiscated tokens the government's taken off criminals over the year. Overall, the GOP 2024 platform supports the right to mine Bitcoin and self-custody of digital assets opposing government surveillance. And this is something Trump has pivoted on just in the last couple of months after he too was previously an outspoken critic of cryptocurrency. He said under his leadership, the US would never sell its Bitcoin. They would hold on to it. And this creates a stark contrasting position 
to that of China, which has pretty much outlawed it and shut down the industry over there. So some people have been saying maybe the US government could play a bit of a game here as it just hit $35 trillion in debt. If it did become a strategic national stockpile, US government started buying it, never selling it, could very well send the price of Bitcoin soaring. And I wouldn't rule out the possibility of Bitcoin hitting $1 million in Trump's second term if he got back into the White House. And then if the US government showed a huge profit on all this Bitcoin, they might better surprise the market, start dollar cost averaging out of it and pay down some of that fiat currency debt. Either way, this is a really interesting turn of events. It'll be interesting to see if we get any reaction out of Xi Jinping in China and what Japan thinks about it as well. Since those two countries are the biggest owners of US treasuries, helping to keep bond yields low, playing a large role in the US dollar, still being the international currency reserve, I'd imagine they might feel a little bit threatened by that or vulnerable to what Bitcoin's going to do and all that if you've got the US government now interested in stockpiling a non-fiat global currency. However, as we all know, it's not guaranteed that Trump will get back in the White House. We do have a lot of mainstream media out there reporting that Kamala Harris is leading Trump in the polls. So as investors, we have to prepare for the real possibility that Harris could be leading the US and playing a big role in global markets for another four years. She's previously spoken against the crypto industry. However, she's looking to reset relations with them kind of becoming a bit more lukewarm on the topic. Mentioned focusing on creating smart regulatory framework, but it's still really yet to be seen what her administration's stance and actions could be towards the crypto industry. Probably not as bullish as what Trump's administration would be. She didn't attend the Bitcoin conference. She's previously said that Bitcoin is money for criminals. And according to big crypto influencers, the Winklevoss twin, who've amassed a fortune in the billions, been longtime bulls in Bitcoin, said the crypto industry will show no mercy to Harris after she snubbed the event and they've spoken in favor of Trump being more supportive of the crypto industry. So there's a look at the weekly chart on Bitcoin. Going back to late 2020 here, with that run up into March 2021, pulled back a bit, shot back up into November 2021. A lot of stocks topped out then. Crashed hard in 2022 along with tech, along with those really high valued stocks, cloud stocks and the like. Bottomed out just below 16,000 a coin. Had a big year last year, even bigger year so far this year. And so technically speaking, it can be argued two ways. Quite often before markets turn, they'll consolidate for a period of time. So it could be argued this is a stage three distribution. And if we were to decisively take out these lows around 55,000, maybe 53,000, could be a confirmed stage four decline. Otherwise, this could still be a healthy consolidation in a stage two advance. No one knows how long it could go on for. But for that to be confirmed, we need a decisive close above 74,000 and for it to hold above there for a period of time as well, not just spike up there and come back down like a fake out. We want it to break out, consolidate, maybe come down and retest this zone and then take off again. And if I get that technical confirmation in Bitcoin, I'll be adding more exposure to this industry in my stock picks portfolio for members, because then in my opinion, we'll have both the fundamentals and the technicals at our back. And like I said, being Bitcoin, anything is possible. But just pivoting back to the stock market, even though it's been trading really well on a Goldilocks scenario, pretty much convinced of a soft landing, that's still not fully assured. We're coming into a bit of seasonal weakness here, August and September. Upcoming presidential election, we normally see a fixed spike going into that. And one thing's for sure, the previous leaders of this market, semis and tech, definitely been tested here and we'll go through their biggest test this week with earnings. Whether these support levels are gonna hold, we're gonna get a nice bounce or they're gonna slice right through. And if they do, how will the rest of the market still hold up as we've been seeing a rotation into dividend, value and small cap stocks. I have a Wharton professor, Jeremy Siegel, think stocks are approaching a watershed moment as rate cuts unlock opportunity in unloved areas of the market. And according to the price action we've been getting, that has definitely been the case. On a lot of measures, it's been in a record rotation and a large cap growth tech into small caps. However, keep in mind, that's a normal and healthy thing. In bull markets, big sector rotations, bear markets, you'll see everything get sold off or most of everything get sold off like in 2022. Pretty much every sector came off hard except energy. It was the real standout. So we'll know more when we hear from Jay Powell this coming Wednesday. What's his language going to be with all these recent developments? What's he thinking now on inflation, on jobs? Will he mention anything about a potential change in the US administration? Will he mention the word tariffs? We'll certainly be paying attention to everything that he says. According to UBS, the sell-off in tech stocks is the chance to buy the dip. They cite attractive valuation, solid fundamentals, and fading technical factors as reason to stick with large cap tech. And no doubt the fundamentals and earnings of large tech is likely to remain strong for some time. However, I'm not sure if I agree that the factors supporting a rotation are likely to fade. As we do have small caps, earnings growth forecast to outpace that of large caps next year as they're more sensitive to Fed rate cuts. So if we get rate cuts, and especially if the economy can still hold up while the cost of capital is coming down, small caps are more sensitive to that. 
They've got more debt, more floating debt. And looking back in history, they can outperform large caps. Even when we do get a recession, rise unemployment and continue outperforming as well, especially coming out of that. And election years typically do well and even better when the incumbent in the White House doesn't run for re-election. Like now is the case. After Biden bowed to pressure and pulled out, looking back in history, when the incumbent doesn't run, the Dow Jones will on average slap on 16.5%. However, like I said earlier this month, we may have just got a bit ahead of ourselves with seasonality, having already done over 15%. So it's no real surprise to see a bit of a pullback and consolidation here. And let's not forget that AI trend is not going anywhere anytime soon. Uploaded a video yesterday on the channel, tutorial of how I use ChatGPT to help my investing. A lot of you guys found it great. And even though you use GPT, you picked up a few new things. So if you didn't check that out, click the link below this video. And there'll also be a shortcut to that tutorial at the end of this video as well, if you're interested in seeing that. I'll show you exactly how I use GPT with some real life example and how you can feed it data now to get accurate answers as by default it's not always right as the technology is still early. However, in my opinion, you can embrace it or you can ignore it and be a late adopter. Either way, it's gonna play a huge role in all of our lives and society. Especially now we've got Nvidia just announcing that they're accelerating humanoid robotic development. It's gonna help Tesla and the Optimus bots and other companies as well. Basically build the brain for these robots. And these are big trends. They're gonna go on for many, many more years. I've actually just got Nvidia CEO Jensen Huang currently talking with Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg. Talking about generative AI. They're really close as well. Mark buys a lot of Nvidia GPUs. Actually claimed He's got the most used AI assistant in the world already. With Meta aiming by the end of the year to have 350,000 NVIDIA H100 GPUs and nearly 600,000 H100 compute equivalent GPUs by the end of the year. And he's actually talked about responsibly open sourcing general intelligence to benefit everyone. And so the spending on the infrastructure is still going to accelerate for many more years. And NVIDIA will be the biggest beneficiary of that because all these other companies buying these GPUs have to turn it into products and services they can sell to customers. NVIDIA is pretty much like the picks and shovel supplier of this whole AI boom. However, let's just keep our expectations tempered by the fact that US tech stocks are on a lot of measures, both valuation and technical, trading pretty stretched relative to the rest of the market. And this very well could play out like the internet bubble, where investors were right about the internet becoming huge, big part of our society and internet companies Revenue eventually growing. They got a little too excited and ahead of themselves on valuations. Hit a blow off top and then of course came crashing down. NASDAQ lost 80% in just a couple of years. Pretty sure a lot of tech investors, if they're too concentrated, may not be prepared for that. So whilst I've got a little exposure to AI, I'm definitely keeping it at bay. Being very selective and if the whole sector shows signs of potentially putting in a stage 3 going into a stage 4 decline, then I'll most likely trim my AI exposure with it as well. And just keep recycling funds into small caps, given that they're expected to grow earnings by 36% next year. So even if they came in at half of that, would still be a good result. Same time, we're supposed to see a slowing of the earnings from the Magnificent Seven, but still healthy double digits. And for the here and now, investors are pouring into bond funds. 149 billion year to date, and US listed exchange traded funds that invest in bonds and other fixed income assets. And it's not too hard to see why, it could be on the cusp of the Fed cutting interest rates. We do have good current yields, bound to earn over 5%, not a bad starting valuation. Also just looking at some technical seasonality, we're around the 140th trading day of the year. Typically TLT can trade up really strong in the coming month or so. And just zooming out in the daily chart has been consolidating pretty much this entire year. Acting a bit better is short dated bond as they've got a good tailwind with the Fed cutting rates, although they're not very volatile at all. What could do a little bit better is investment grade bond. Not as volatile as junk bonds, but will give you a bit more movement and yield than short dated government bonds. And so just moving on to the global macro with that, those yields coming down, we have had pretty good rally in bonds. Trade is expecting the Fed to cut in September, pretty much priced in 100% chance, even more than 100% chance, pricing in about 32 or so basis points and cuts in September. There has been a global policy shift. ECB, Bank of Canada, Swiss National Bank all cut over the past couple of months. And we've still got that lurking problem with the US just hitting a record 35 trillion in national debt for the first time would really help the American taxpayer, if the cost to repay all that debt was a little bit cheaper. And the fact that the US government is currently spending at an unsustainable pace. Just looking last year, they made 4.4 trillion in revenue, 420 billion in corporate tax, 1.6 trillion in payroll tax, with the lion's share coming from individual income tax, 2.1 trillion. Spending on the other hand, 1.7 trillion in discretionary spending, 1.3 in social security, almost 900 billion and other mandatory spending, about 1.5 trillion in medical spending. And this component here 
is growing quite a lot. This is actually outdated data. I think the US is on track to spend a trillion this year just in interest on its debt because the deficit, the difference between what they spend and what they earn, they have to sell bonds to big investors all around the world and then they have to pay them back interest on that $35 trillion of debt. Unfortunately, about half of it is due to the wars that have been waged by US governments around the world over the past couple of decades, where a lot of Americans had wished that had been spent on renovating the country, improving its infrastructure, airports, bridges, roads, parks, border security, just to name a few. However, don't count on the US dollar going away anytime soon. We've got one currency expert saying de-dollarization is a fad that will backfire on countries trying it. That's Jeffrey Christian, said the US dollar remains dominant in global markets. There'll be consequences for countries attempting to move away from the dollar, potentially facing liquidity issues, limited trade, and potential loss of value in their reserves. And that even if the de-dollarization succeeds, it would still take decades before something else replaced. Moving on to commodities, we've got the big short investors. That's Danny Moses, Porter Collins, and Vincent Daniel, saying why they're bullish on gold. Highlighting growing US debt levels, predicting it may lead to a significant debasement of the dollar. They like it as an inflation hedge. They note weakening demand for US treasuries and the current momentum in the price of the shiny metal has all been tailwinds. Just moving on to oil, trading pretty tame of late. Did see a bit of a spark up in Israel Hezbollah tensions over the weekend after the market had been hoping for a ceasefire talk between Israel and Gaza. We did see the Venezuelan election over the weekend with widespread belief that Nicolas Maduro corrupted the process. Didn't really have a big impact on oil markets, even though they're a decent sized producer. But we did see the US Energy Department purchase 4.56 million barrels for the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, sticking to their word of replenishing it. Just moving on to Goldman Sachs expectations for this week. Out of the FOMC, they expect hints towards future rate cuts. They see likely revisions with a rise in unemployment, but still low. Progress towards 2% inflation. Balanced risks for the mandate. Need for only slightly more confidence in inflation outlook to cut rates. Forecast first cut in September, followed by quarterly cuts. And I agree with all that as well. It's what I've been saying for a little while now. What they see for the labor market this Friday, July payrolls. Expected increase of 165,000 versus consensus 178,000. Unemployment rate flat 4.1. Job growth may accelerate due to seasonal influx. Moderated by factors like hurricane barrel and immigration. They expect a rise in average hourly earnings and employment cost index. And I'd say that's fair as well. I'd be surprised if unemployment came in too far away from that number, 4.1. The biggest week in Q2 earnings season. Monday starts off a little slow. Then tomorrow, after the close, we've got Microsoft and AMD. Going into Wednesday, before the Bell, MasterCard, T-Mobile, Boeing. After the Bell, Meta, Qualcomm, and Arm. And then on Thursday, we start getting into some of the energy names. And the big one, Apple, Amazon, and Intel after the close. Then a few more oil producers to kick off Friday morning. So far, so good. Pretty good beats. Not on revenue, more so on EPS. Combined together, tracking well above average and on misses as well. So, so far, so good. We're almost halfway through all the S&P 500 companies that have reported. We'll also be looking this week at the spreads between value and growth stocks. Growth sectors versus defensive. Looking at this support box for high beta versus low volatility. We may get a pause in the rotation into smalls versus bigs, along with the defensive rotation into staples. Still got some weakness in copper versus gold. Bond spreads hanging in there. Inflation expectations coming down. And sectors I'll be following this week where I'm looking to make stock pick number nine for my members. I think it's either going to be in the financials, industrials, or aerospace and defense breaking out to all-time highs. I don't have any of those stocks in my stock picks portfolio. I'll be looking to diversify further into some more leading sectors. And tomorrow, we'll see what Microsoft brings us with their earnings after the bell. Okay, so I've got you all prepped for the this week. Thanks very much for tuning in and stick with Click Capital this week. It's going to be a big one. I'll keep you informed of everything that's happening out there. See you again tomorrow, guys. Cheers.